Good afternoon and welcome to the Digital Health Business Forum. The mission of the forum is to serve as a premier information resource for digital health companies and investors in those companies. Uh, we aim to accomplish the mission by providing periodic updates to you via quarterly webinars like the one today, as well as through periodic alerts and blogs. There's a, no cost to be a member of the forum, and by, by participating today, you will be provided access to all of these benefits. By way of introduction, my name is Drew Gant. I'm a partner and co-chair of Venables Healthcare Group, and I'm joined today by my partner and co-chair, Tora Johnson, Neela Paykel, who is Vice President and Head of Legal Affairs and Compliance at Proteus Digital Health, and by my partner, Jim Nelson, who's partner in charge of Venable's San Francisco office. Our agenda today will be as follows. We're going to spend roughly a third of the time today on the legislative and regulatory update. There have obviously been a lot of developments recently uh, with respect to repeal and replace legislation and some developments in telemedicine, particularly that are changing by the minute. Um, and then we want to follow that by providing uh, the company in the spotlight, which is essentially a spotlight on a particularly uh, innovative and disruptive company. And this time we're featuring Proteus Digital Health, and Neil is going to explain a little bit about what their company is up to. And then we're going to wrap up with a corporate update, which will provide information uh, that is relevant to the investor community and, and corporate folks uh, with respect to developments and trends on that front. Uh, with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Tora, who's going to provide a legislative update. Thank you, Drew. And um, for audiences on the webinar, thank you for joining us today. And we will take questions at the end via the chat feature. So uh, I thought we would begin, or we thought we would begin today, uh, with the very current efforts to repeal and replace the ACA. And this first slide is meant to capture the highlights of recent action in Congress to do just that. To bring us current to today, let's begin with the House passing the American Health Care Act on May 4th. Notably, no Democrats voted in favor of the act, and it narrowly passed. The Senate Republicans, a few months later, then took the next step and released their draft repeal and replace legislation, known as the Better Care Reconciliation Act. In fact, they have proposed three versions of their bill in an effort to secure the needed votes to pass it. In the big picture, however, the House and the Senate bills are relatively similar. They do differ in the details, but as a big picture, they would eliminate the individual mandate requiring individuals to have health coverage, eliminate the employer mandate requiring employers to offer health coverage to their full-time employees, repeal the Medicaid expansion, and cap, relatively dramatically, the overall federal spending on Medicaid. It also would, they, both bills would also uh, reduce premium subsidies on the insurance exchanges and eliminate many of the ACA taxes. The Senate Republicans are hoping to use the budget reconciliation process to pass their bill. It permits uh, the Senate Republicans to pass a bill with a simple majority, that is 51 votes rather than the normally required 60 votes. However, to take advantage of the budget reconciliation process, the provisions in the bill, to grossly oversimplify matters, must change the federal spending or revenues, and the budgetary effects cannot be merely incidental to a policy objective. So late last Friday, not only was it unclear whether the Republicans in the Senate had enough votes, but the Senate parliamentarian who guides the Senate opined that some of the provisions of the Better Care Act do not satisfy the standard. As such, it was really unclear whether a vote would go forward, and in the midst of all of this uncertainty, the Senate Republicans also released a repeal-only bill that would immediately repeal the individual and employer mandates, and then in two years' time, it would eliminate funding for Medicaid expansion 
and tax credits to purchase health insurance on the insurance exchanges. Yesterday, though, the Senate Republicans took a very significant step forward in passing legislation. They passed a motion to proceed, which is the first required procedural step before a vote on a bill can occur in the Senate under the budget reconciliation process. Two Republicans did not vote for the motion, but Vice President Pence delivered the tie-breaking vote in favor of proceeding to debate and vote on a repeal or repeal and replace bill. And last night, the Senate voted on the Better Care Act, and it did not survive. And it's likely that during the hour that we're spending with you today, there'll be a vote on, a debate and vote, on a straight repeal bill. Um, but I don't think that uh, folks are expecting that that bill will um, get a favorable vote. And in the end, what many people are beginning to say, that a likely outcome may be a skinny repeal bill. And this would be a very targeted repeal bill that would eliminate the individual and employer mandates and significantly to the folks on the phone today, the medical device tax. If that were the case, and again, I'm using a crystal ball, if that were the case, then the thought is that it would head to conference whereby members from each house would work out the differences between the House bill and the skinny repeal bill. So this next slide is meant to capture the number of Americans who would lose coverage under the House bill and the various proposed Senate bills. I don't believe, though, that the CBA, CBO has yet to release the number who would lose coverage under a skinny repeal bill. Next. So what does this mean for digital health? Significantly, there's little direct impact on digital health companies in these repeal and replacement bills, except that they would all permanently repeal the 2.3% medical device tax. And this is something really to keep uh, focused on because the moratorium on this tax ends on December 31st, 2017. Indirectly, though, the passage of any of this legislation um, would have a significant impact on digital health companies. And actually, maybe there's some potential opportunity in its passage. I think you would see in the rollback of coverage pressure on payers and providers to drive efficiencies, and that might be best accomplished by investing in digital health. Likewise, I think you'll see a continued interest in big data and the use of it to, uh, to drive population health management. And similarly, consumers with perhaps less robust coverage will be looking for alternative, alternative delivery models of medical care and, to tools, and for tools to help them gauge the relative costs of various services. And in the end, telehealth may be able to step into the lurch and assist. And Drew is going to give us some, uh, some update on the current activity in that very busy space. So in general, telemedicine is increasing significantly. Um, from 2008 to 2014, six-year period, number of telehealth visits for Medicare beneficiaries grew by over 500%. The American Telemedicine Association estimated that there were 1.25 million visits in 2016. And Teladoc, which is the largest uh, private provider of telehealth services in the United States, hit a record of 101,000 monthly visits last November. So the general trend in telemedicine uh, particularly driven by consumer demand in the private sector, is growing significantly. I also note that over 30 states plus the District of Columbia now have telehealth parity laws that basically mandate that private insurers cover telehealth services in the same manner that they would face-to-face -face services. Um, and the number of states that have passed these laws has doubled in the past four years. I also wanted to just give a brief summary of what's happened with Teladoc litigation. So a number of years ago, the Texas Board of Medicine passed a rule that essentially said that you had to have face-to-face -face physical examinations in order to establish a physician-patient relationship, and notably in order to issue a prescription. Um, this effectively had the practical effect of, of 
preventing Teladoc from providing any services, any telehealth services in the state of Texas. Teladoc, as you recall, is not only the largest telehealth services provider, but based in Texas. So this was really a slap in the face to Teladoc that had become successful and started providing a significant number of services both within Texas and outside. Teladoc sued basically arguing that the Texas Medical Board's requirement violated antitrust laws, relying on a Supreme Court case, uh, North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners, um, which held that state licensing boards that are controlled by active market participants, meaning practicing dentists in that case or physicians in the case of Teladoc, are not immune from antitrust claims unless they're actively supervised by the state. As a practical matter, most licensing boards are run by active market participants and are not closely supervised by the state legislatures. So this essentially uh, allowed Teladoc to successfully argue that, that the Texas Medical Board had uh, violated antitrust laws and in fact, the FTC and the Department of Justice weighed in in favor of Teladoc. Um, while the state was getting ready to appeal the, uh, the decision not to dismiss this case, the Texas legislature passed a law allowing doctors to diagnose and treat patients remotely without an initial face-to-face -face meeting. So this effectively rendered this case moot as a practical matter because it effectively undid the Texas Medical Board's rule. But this really shoots, fires a shot across the bow of uh, state licensing boards that would adopt uh, any competitive laws that basically restrict use of telemedicine by including requirements such as the Texas Board has done and makes them subject to antitrust violation. So last year, just going back a year, the 21st Century Cures Act was passed uh, with bipartisan support in both houses of Congress, and there were a couple things that were relevant to to all of us. One was that it created a mechanism by which CMS and the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC, would conduct studies and evaluate both how Medicare and Medicaid populations could benefit from expanding telehealth services and how current coverage of telehealth by Medicare and Medicaid compares to how the private sector is covering it. Um, those reports are due in the next couple of years and are likely to be uh, relied on heavily by the legislature in deciding how to move forward with telehealth. Secondly, uh, 21st Century Cures barred the FDA from regulating mobile health apps essentially focused on wellness that encourage a healthy lifestyle but that are unrelated to diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of disease, which typically requires approval. Um, lastly, it really established a strong role for the Office of National Coordinator of Health Information Technology in the regulation and development of HIT standards uh, in recognizing that the ONC was critical to driving interoperability between um, exchange uh, healthcare exchanges in the vision of assuming that healthcare exchanges would would need to have some essentially some ground rules as to how they would communicate with each other in order to successfully exchange health information. Uh, notably, the Trump administration has proposed a budget which would slash the ONC's uh, budget by twenty two uh, million dollars. So. Um, it's anyone's best guess as to whether or not they'll be able to fill that role given their budgetary constraints. Lastly, I just note that Congress essentially is remains interested in telehealth but doesn't really know what to do with it. Um, there I, is a lot of promise, obviously, to increase access to telehealth, uh, which is driving a number of bills that have been introduced, but there's significant concern particularly given how popular it is in the private sector, that um, that this will be lead to uncontrollable cost increases um, and essentially be, be uh, unfeasible from a fiscal perspective. So there was uh, one bill that was passed uh, this last week that would effectively 
provide telehealth, it was HR 3178, which would allow telemedicine visits for end stage renal disease treatment, uh, but it's a very limited it's a very limited act, and again, it's only passed the House so far. So we're going to keep a close watch on on regulation of telemedicine. Uh, there's a lot of activity, but not a lot of traction so far, and we'll see how that moves forward. Lastly, I just wanted to give an update about uh, HIPAA enforcement of HIPAA breaches and compliance. Um, Two years ago, we really hit the high watermark for healthcare data breaches in the United States, with one of every three Americans' health information being breached uh, in, in essentially three main breaches with Anthem, Premier, and XL. Um, they were attributable to hacking incidents, uh, which was a new development in the past. Most data breaches have been attributable to theft or loss of mobile media. Um, and, you know, it's, it's to be anticipated that with the exponential increase of digital health information and the criticality of that information that um, you have an increase in the number of breaches, uh, particularly because health information as a practical matter has become more valuable than credit card and other financial information that previously has been the focus of hackers. Typically, a credit card can be used once before it's no longer uh, available for use once it's been stolen, versus health information uh, that's stolen. If you have uh, health information, you can typically use it. Multiple parties can use it multiple times before it gets shut down. Um, and so it, it makes it much more valuable on the open market. Uh, notably, the first wireless health service provider reached a $2.5 million settlement this year uh, attributed to an investigation that followed a stolen laptop from an employee's car. Um, the uh, wireless health services provider had draft policies and procedures under HIPAA but had not moved forward and, and developed a robust compliance program. And when OCR came and investigated them, they, they found them to be lacking. Um, although this is the first for digital health companies, there have been many 50 resolution agreements in the past decade. And notably, the Trump administration is at least as aggressive as the Obama administration in, in enforcing HIPAA. There to date have been nine settlement agreements reached through May of this year. Uh, compared to 13 for all of last year, uh, which was previously a high watermark. Prior to that, there'd been no more than six in any given year. So the enforcement con trend only continues to increase uh, despite, uh, I think, what folks might have thought the Trump administration would do. It, it hasn't abated at all. Um, also, I note that the, uh, lastly, that class section lawsuits uh, really Trump uh, governmental settlements in terms of the magnitude of the settlement, notably Anthem, which had the biggest breach of almost 79 million people uh, in 2015, uh, reached a settlement of $115 million uh, in their class action lawsuits stemming from that breach, which is significant money. I'm now going to turn it over to Neela, who will talk about Proteus. All right, thank you, and I'm excited to have this opportunity to speak to such a diverse group of people. Um, in your deck, you have some fairly detailed slides. I'm actually not going to go through them in um, at length. You can read them at your leisure. What I am going to do instead is to give you a high overview, um, a high level overview of, of Proteus. Um, so Proteus has been around for about 10 years. We are still privately funded, and we've created a new therapeutic area called digital medicine. Um, digital medicines talk to your phones. They are, um, we have invented an ingestible sensor pill that is FDA approved, as well as a wearable patch. You swallow the uh, ingestible sensor that's embedded in a pill, you swallow it, it's the size of a grain of sand. So it's not this huge pill or anything like that. It is incredibly tiny. 
and you swallow it along with your oral medication, it then basically becomes a battery and reads um, through an electro electromagnetic signal to a patch that you wear on your body. The patch is also FDA approved as a 510K medical device. Um, it reads to a patch on your body, which then sends a signal to an app that is downloaded on your phone. And the uh, app also sends via Bluetooth a signal to a portal for your physician. And what both the app and the portal will tell you is the app will tell you as a patient that you've actually taken your drug, what time you took it, which dose did you take, um, how it also records certain physiological aspects of yourself, such as um, activity, rest, um, heartbeat, those types of things. And um, and so it really gives you a, a brief snapshot of, of what you um, experienced after you took your medication, but it also tells your doctor what the schedule is that you're actually taking, it on, uh, taking your medication on. So for example, you'll see we've done some, um, some extensive clinical testing. One of the, the, the tests revealed that we would have, you have patients who are maybe on a regimen of four pills a day. They're supposed to take two in the morning and two in the afternoon. Sometimes if they forget, they just take four in the morning the next day. And if you ask them, did they adhere to their medication schedule, they'll say yes, because as far as they're concerned, they took four pills in one day. So it is really designed to provide an accurate snapshot because what else we've discovered and really the, the um, the uh, the impetus for creating Proteus is answering two specific questions. Did the patient take their pill and did the pill work? And so with Proteus and our, um, and our device, you can actually see that happening. And the doctor doesn't have to question the accuracy, doesn't have to rely on a patient's memory. The doctor herself can see from the portal that she has whether her patient sitting in front of her has actually followed her dosing regimen. Um, and in fact, with the uh, FDA 510K approval, the ingestible sensor was created as a de novo category, um, and it's now called an ingestible event marker, um, IEM is what we call it. And, um, and so that was also just a, a really um, exciting thing that happened for Proteus was our ability to create this de novo category. We now have um, several customers, who's, um, several hospital system customers whose patients are actually on Proteus um, and are seeing some fantastic results, are very happy with it. And, um, and so we are also have some revenue coming in and it's all very exciting. Um, next slide, please. Okay. I stated they communicate with your mobile when swallowed. Next slide. The clinical validation. Um, why don't we go on to, as I said, these are, I spoke very high level, and these are more detailed slides. If we can go ahead and move on to um, the slide with the legal issues that I've, that I've outlined. <laughs> Right there, thank you. Um, so I am gonna focus on the legal issues today because I am a lawyer. Um, one of the things I did wanna mention though is why did Proteus even bother hiring someone like me? I'm a seasoned healthcare lawyer, and when I started at Proteus, we already had two lawyers, an IP lawyer and a lawyer who specialized in technology contracts work. But Proteus decided to need a healthcare law expert because it's truly the intersection among technology, pharma, devices, and healthcare services. When I look at an issue, um, I have to look at all of these different aspects of it and in a very interesting way also look at all the various legal risks that fall into these different parts of the law. The, you know, having come from a pharmaceutical company before, the legal risk involved is much, um, is much different, is um, in some ways more tangible than the legal risk involved with a, with a technology, traditional technology company, for example. So I'm always balancing these different issues and it makes the work incredibly um, exciting and challenging at the same time. So if we could go ahead and move on to the legal issues for digital health. Um, first, of course, is privacy. Oops. 
there, there we go, um, is, is privacy. And I put it there three times because that seems to take up so much of my bandwidth at work um, and security, of course, too. And what's interesting to me is um, how we use those terms interchangeably, but as an attorney, I really do have to look at those two things very separately because to me, privacy is what information do we have? What can we collect? Who can see that information? How can we use that information? And the security is how do we protect that information? Now, when we talk about digital health, health technology, medical technology, privacy is absolutely the number one issue on all of our on all of our minds. And one thing that's become so apparent to me, and, it, and it's kind of ironic in some ways, is that we as a culture are willing to share every minute of our lives on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, what have you. We're even willing to let Apple collect data about our finances through Apple Pay, but we are very protective of our healthcare data. And as Drew mentioned, the healthcare data is incredibly valuable out there in the marketplace as well, so it's understandable. But at the same time, there's this very interesting dichotomy between the Apples and the Googles of the world who have so much access to data and use it in very granular levels and a company like ours, which is digital health. The minute you enter that healthcare space, you have to think about your data very differently and how you communicate to your, to your users about how we use our data. Um, and so let me talk a little bit about how we actually address this at Proteus. And so because our customers are hospital systems um, and therefore covered entities under HIPAA, we actually have entered into business associate agreements um, in limited respects with respect to um, receipt and use of certain claims data. Now, to be totally frank, when I joined Proteus about a year ago, that was one of the first questions I had. I dug into are we truly a business associate? How does HIPAA apply to us in this respect? Where is the line drawn? And we realized that it was, in some ways, a simple business issue that our hospital systems were, of course, very concerned with protecting their healthcare data and not being the anthems of the world or you know, or targets of the world or what have you. Um, and so it wasn't for them just a legal or compliance risk. It was a true reputation risk. And we thought, um, from our from our business and legal perspective, that it made sense to enter into these business associate agreements um, for limited purposes. Um, that being said, we have taken the position that we are not actually a covered entity because we don't use and collect the data on behalf of um, a covered entity. We are working with the individual and on their behalf and at their consent. Um, in addition to, we're not, we're not otherwise creating new PHI, we're using information that's otherwise provided and copied from an electronic health record. So we've taken the position that we don't, um, we're not required to comply with HIPAA in of itself as a covered entity. Recently, we have um, been reviewing these types of decisions and positions, and not that we've changed our position, but we have decided to move ahead and comply with certain aspects of HIPAA. We believe it makes good business sense to do so, and we believe it's the right thing to do for our patients. And with that has, um, has also come the um, ability to, to really speak more about how we address privacy concerns. We feel that we are providing better protection to our patients as well. We've also taken undertaken, as a result of complying with um, certain aspects of HIPAA, the, um, the security aspects that come along with it. So if I can move on to um, the, the second issue there of security, Cybersecurity is another major issue that we are concerned with at Proteus. And it's not just protecting our patients' data, but it's also protecting our own data, such as IP, software, manufacturing processes, and, and so forth. Um, we're really focused on, on um, cybersecurity and how we interact with um, with our customers, how we interact with um, other vendors that we have, whether it's a cloud service provider, whether it's a, a vendor who provides our wearable patch, 
or what have you. And so we make sure, and we're working together um, these days very significantly. My new director of, cyber, of security and I, or excuse me, of IT and I are working very closely together to, um, to make sure that we move forward our cybersecurity plan. Unfortunately, cybersecurity risk is one of those things where the minute you think you've got a handle on it, you don't, and you're already back behind the times. And so it seems to be always a, um, a catch-up kind of, of endeavor as opposed to feeling like you've got it under control. But I've got a great new partner in crime with my director of IT, and we're really working towards getting this um, off the ground. And you know, between those two issues, I feel like those are the two biggest hurdles you deal with with any digital health company. Um, it, the the use of data, the the value of the data, how it can be um, used to further telemedicine, uh, population health, like Drew spoke of earlier is going to be key to having a more efficient and effective healthcare delivery system. And so we really want to make sure that our data is, is not only good data, but also uh, safe data. Um, I'm going to move away from this a little bit, and actually I'm going to um, move on to FDA-regulated device. And we made the decision to go for uh, a 510K approval. Not everyone chooses to do that, but we decided to do that because we felt that that was, um, it would give us certain business advantages out in the marketplace. It would also give us um, not only the ability to say we are an FDA approved device, but what comes with that is that we're really innovative technology. It's, it's very hard for people to understand what it is our technology actually is. And, and our co-founder, um, one of our co-founders, George Savage, mentioned, um, tells this great story of how he was sitting with FDA reviewers when they were looking at um, our ingestible sensor, and they just didn't understand what it was we were talking about. And George finally pulled out the actual sensor, and they realized how small it was. It wasn't some horse pill that, they, that people were going to be expecting to take. It's so small. It's made up of three elements that are already in your body. It stays active in your body for about a minute, and that's it. And then they finally understood what it was that we were actually talking about. So we felt that going with um, the ability to say it's an FDA-approved device was really key to, to having adoption of our technology. That being said, it means that we have to deal with whatever FDA regulation brings. Um, yes, we're a device. We're not a pharma or, or a pharmaceutical, I should say. Um, so some of the um, some of the regulation is a li little bit easier, I guess, if you can say that, to deal with. But we still have to have FDA audits. We still have to show that we're complying with good manufacturing practices every time we want to change um, an aspect of either of our devices. We have to think about whether we need to go to FDA for um, further approval or new approval. Um, we also have to do take into consideration promotional rules and marketing rules as well. If you're not going to be regulated by FDA, and a lot of the health apps out there these days and health tech companies aren't, you don't have to worry about that. They can iterate much faster. They can um, they do what they do without a lot of oversight from FDA. And so that was um, a decision that we don't regret, but it d does come with certain obligations as well. Now, what that also allows us to do, on the other hand, is that we have the direct ability to, um, to speak with FDA about their digital program, about where they're looking to innovate. Um, FDA recently announced that they were going to start a whole digital um, innovative type group, and they're looking to hire, I believe, 15 or 20 new employees just in that space. They're having some trouble hiring those folks, but they are really focused on doing that. I think some of that's from 21st Century Cares as well, but it's something that, that, they, that they understand they need to um, they need to innovate on and, and come into um, the 21st century with as well. Um, finally, I'm going to uh, address really quickly the um, pharmacy services risk. The anti-kickback risk is, is, is pretty straightforward, but it is still there, and it, 
it comes up in um, lots of different ways, but it's a basic anti-kickback risk. But the pharmacy services risk is, is definitely a new one. So what we are um, always contending with is how do um, pharmacies, pharmacists handle our product? Um, right now it is being co-ingested, as some of you may have heard. Proteus is working with Otsuka Pharmaceuticals. We've um, recently refiled the NDA. Uh, the NDA after receiving a complete response letter last year. We're waiting for a response with an anticipated PDUFA date of October of 2017. But um, so right now it's being co-ingested with your oral medication or in some cases co-encapsulated. And we are working with pharmacies around the country about what does that look like? How do you get reimbursed for that? Is that is co-encapsulation a repackaging? Is it compounding? Is it what? What is it exactly within the practice of pharmacy? And so that's one of those issues where no one's ever looked at that before, and we're looking at it brand new and, and trying to figure it out. And that's what makes um, being a Proteus such a such an exciting and um, challenging place to be. But it's a it's a great company, and we're very excited for what we're able to do out out in the healthcare system. Excellent. Well, this is, uh, thank you for that, Neela. Um, this is Jim Nelson. Uh, I'm partner in charge in the San Francisco office, as Drew had mentioned, and I have a practice doing general corporate work. So I'm going to give you an update on kind of where things are from a funding and general uh, corporate development standpoint in the uh, digital health space. As Neela and I were discussing earlier, that's a little bit amorphous as to what the definition is to that. But um, the uh, broad picture here, uh, and I'm going to, I'll stay with this slide and then kind of take you through a few from uh, Rock Health that uh, has some statistics that drill down more specifically in the digital health space. But the, the headline or the theme is that essentially so goes, uh, or digital health is essentially uh, going right along with the uh, rapid growth and rapid raise in the uh, emerging growth venture community generally. Um, I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, in spite of some of the um, uh, legislative uh, uh, activities that Toro was touching on that uh, certainly create uncertainty and typically uh, companies uh, would prefer not uh, to be facing uncertainty, I think many of the activities in the digital health space are succeeding in spite of because it's a longer run focus um, and not directly influenced by some of the current legislative activities. Um, more broadly within the financing sector overall, uh, it's uh, clear that there is a very active funding stream. More and more funds uh, are being raised, small and large. Um, we also are now in a position where, uh, particularly this year, liquidity events, um, both uh, IPOs and also uh, other financial exits, are uh, increasing in pace, which always provides a nice appetite for those making investments if they can start uh, having some understanding of, of uh, exits being near um, as opposed to just um, waiting out to see what might happen for uh, for years to come. So it's, it's nice to see that there are uh, a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to uh, getting liquid in, in some uh, investor communities. Um, on, th on top of that, we have interest rates that continue. I think the Fed uh, just uh, recently had had more uh, neutral uh, feedback as far as what might happen on rates. So there is a continued effort to try and uh, do better than uh, what a lot of the uh, fixed income and more of the um, uh, less uh, venture uh, investments would, would return. Um, it's also the case that there are institutional investors, larger institutional investors, that are looking to get more active in the emerging growth space. Again, in the um, race for returns, I think, uh, you know, it's as any kind of cycle as it goes. We're certainly in a position where there are plenty of, uh, there's plenty of liquidity chasing assets, and I think the ultimate question is, how many quality assets are there out there um, for the significant funding that's available? Um, 
in spite of that, though, I mean, funds are in a position that limited partners put the money in, and they want to they want uh, the money put to work, and so there's pressure uh, for that to be occurring. I will emphasize, uh, Neil and I sitting here in San Francisco, the Bay Area continues to be quite active and quite hot overall, um, but it is spread throughout uh, the country certainly, and also globally there is activity. Europe continues to have. Um, good activity, but um, the main point uh, here is within the U.S., uh, it's, uh, it's broad-based and strong. So specifically then um, in the digital health sector, uh, I would just highlight that um, it's still a large market as touched upon earlier and it's still being defined. I'm going to talk about the categories uh, that at least Rock Health highlights as active categories uh, in, a, in a later slide, but the bottom line is the digital health sector is um, is hot and interesting and compelling um, to uh, to the investor community. There are unique issues. Some of these were touched upon earlier. Uh, Neil, in particular, highlighting the unique regulatory hurdles. So it is true with companies in the digital health space as opposed to some other consumer startups or. Uh, emerging growth companies that um, may be in um, sectors that are not uh, as uh, heavily regulated may have some simpler um, paths to get started. It's important for many of the companies in the early stage emerging growth space to make sure they have um, uh, questions asked and answered when it comes to playing in certain markets, and that can be everything from knowledge of what is permitted or, or not permitted, approvals, FDA, as it was uh, noted earlier. Um, there's also uh, reimbursement and where funding sources may be for eventual customers. After all, uh, most people investing companies do want to have a, a good idea of who are your customers and how are they going to pay for things. And so, um, good knowledge of the reimbursement programs, whether you're in or you're out, and in uh, what might be available is key. Um, the other thing I would highlight too is, um, and this comes from some direct experience with a, a panel I saw recently, um, where there were uh, UCSF and Kaiser folks involved. But it is clear, particularly when you're selling to the provider community, that these are large organizations, long lead time sales. And so the um, strategic ability to kind of penetrate some of these markets, even if you've got a great product, uh, the need to be proactive in thinking about how are you actually going to get an audience and how are you going to be in a position to uh, um, get people to buy what you're selling is is key. Um, highlighting that, I, I would say we just we do sponsor, we support a Skydeck, which is an incubator at Berkeley. Their last cohort was. Um, almost exclusively healthcare startup companies, um, and uh, it's notable that that is an area of uh, such strength that it dominated uh, the incoming class for the organization. So on the next slide, I'll kind of get into some of the information uh, details and background just to kind of highlight um, particular numbers that I think are interesting. So obviously, again, the market itself and the funding that's available um, in emerging growth is substantial. Um, the amount that's within digital health um, is uh, is growing rapidly, and in fact, in some of the information I had seen, uh, this slide shows it well, and that there was a perception in Q1 of this year that things were steady as she goes, if not even a little quiet. Um, and then interestingly, in Q2, uh, things have really moved all the more, and I have to say I'm not quite sure. I, you know, I go to Torah's timeline on uh, discussions in Washington and what was going on, and, and it's certainly in spite of any um, sensitivities, and maybe perhaps it's the recognition and awareness that regardless of what's going on with Affordable Care Act or other uh, legislation involving um, the payment, the fact of the matter is that the delivery of care um, and the mechanisms uh, to deliver better quality, make it more available, um, those areas where digital health is playing are going to be important notes and um, are going to drive opportunities regardless of 
what practices um, may be there. Obviously, there'll be interest and concern in tax regime and in reimbursements, as noted earlier, but the broad brush uh, opportunity within digital health is um, is uh, significant and uh, continuing to grow. There's certainly nothing that I've seen that suggests that there would be um, caution, and I think the current activity, again, in D.C., and the fact that it's it's going against that suggests that um, people are um, uh, ingesting the information and recognizing that we're going to continue these are longer-run investments and will succeed in spite of some of the um, shocks as opposed to uh, being overly concerned by them. Um, or I guess I should say potential shocks. We'll see what transpires. But next slide, please. Um, so also highlighting that the size uh, of rounds, I think it's interesting in looking at a lot of the information in the investor uh, decks that the both volume of deals, number of deals, as well as the size of the deals um, are all growing. I note Proteus here uh, with their round in, in 2014 for their funding. These are deals that are in excess of $100 million plus, um, which are significant investments, obviously, for, um, for companies that are on the grow. I will note that this year, um, Outcome Health, which is a 2017 investment there, that was a $500 million Series A. Um, so the um, size of the investments that are going into uh, these companies are substantial, which, which says a couple of things. One, obviously, those making the investments um, are concerned down the road, are people going to um, be making investments where the overall valuation is going to continue to increase? And this is certainly a vote of confidence that the belief that the momentum is there to continue the growth and to continue that opportunity. Um, it's also a situation where the companies have to have the ability to put that type of capital to use. So um, the need to manage and, um, and put it to use within the company effectively is going to be closely watched by the investor class, uh, obviously, but they wouldn't be making the investments if it wasn't enough of a uh, foundation there to really um, uh, grow the opportunity. So further ones just to highlight, and I think Peloton may be a little bit of an outlier or a distort, distortion, which I'll show in the next slide, but they're in, fit, in a fitness equi equipment or connected equipment in the cycling space. Anyway, that was a $325 million Series E. There, in my mind, that moves a little bit, and I haven't done the full uh, kick of the tires with them, but there is clearly an equipment side of things and just general um, uh, exercise materials that's different than, than more information technology, metal, medical records, or what I would say, and I think this may be a bit of the stretch of kind of what is considered digital health. Um, and then thirdly, just to kind of round out, um, we've got um, these other ones that are listed here with the, uh, um, all, you know, all in excess of $100 million. And, and again, you know, we're looking at this, we're not all the way through 2017. So, um, we're definitely moving moving right along. Next slide, please. Um, so here we are on the categories. You know, I'd highlight that middle digital gym equipment. That's largely Peloton hit that number. Again, I would emphasize it's interesting both the number of deals as well as the total value and funding. Um, my observations and picking up on what Neela had referenced in her presentation and as part of Proteus also, I still think as in digital health, as in other areas, data is driving a ton of this. And so I actually would converge the analytics big data category with the consumer health information. Uh, in my mind, in some ways, consumer health information may be a precursor uh, to analytics big data. Um, many companies are in positions where they are in uh, heavy data acquisition mode uh, where the ability to monetize it or where they may gain value from it um, is is still yet to be determined, but they're, um, they know that the information is uh, is valuable and the ability to manage it both with the 
a continued increase in sophistication of computing power as well as the volume of data that can be gathered is all um, driving more and more uh, ability to uh, to kind of find the needle at the haystack, so to speak, or patterns that would be um, valuable uh, to someone. Um, and then lastly, I would show the uh, uh, last slide. Uh, next slide would be uh, really just highlighting the notion again on the exits as we round out the presentation. But the returns that are in the digital health space, there's a lot of energy here. Um, a lot of people, me included, wouldn't mind having this portfolio um, towards the top, certainly. So uh, the companies in this space are um, uh, that have hit the public markets are um, are showing well, which uh, is a bit of the rising tide uh, raises all boats that are uh, playing in that space. So with that, mindful of time, I think we uh, uh, get to the questions, which would be the next slide. And I think as Tora had noted, um, we were saving questions to the end, so we'll uh, we'll proceed to questions. Jim, it's Drew. Um, one question on your slide uh, of top categories: Is wearables fit in there anywhere, or is is there any um, are they subsumed under any of those categories, or are they not one of the top categories? Um, I think in the um, as I was looking at it, the um, let me look back for the particular items. I think in the healthcare consumer engagement, that includes or encompasses. Um, some aspects of wearables. I, I will say I did note that this category, these categories have changed. The only category that was last here last year and here this year is the analytics big data. Um, okay. So I know, and this is partly, I guess it's the value, always good to have a top list, but it's a distortion, a possible distortion in that some of these, both on size of deals and volumes, um, I, th I think the, the punchline is, um, the digital health sector overall is very active and kind of what's top for any particular year uh, continues uh, to vary. I will say wearables that that touch uh, the consumer side of things are areas where I've seen quite a bit of activity and I will say even in the startups that we've been working with, uh, wearables, I would say wearables in the, in the data mining or uh, Data review areas are the um, the two hot areas where I've seen on a startup basis. Mm -hmm. I do note, as an aside, I will say one of the underperformers on the public company listing that I believe was Fitbit, um, who uh, you know was the the darling for a while and has slowed um, a bit. But I think some of that may be as well as just new entrants in the particular space that are. Um, they they kind of had a lot of that market to themselves for a while. Right. Okay. Uh, Neil, I just wanted to follow up with you a little bit about um, about your um, business model and specifically how with Otsuka, do you have do you have a license agreement with them, or what is your what is your kind of model with respect to Collaborating with pharmaceutical companies that you know who um, well, centers that yeah um, we're continuing to, to you develop and iterate it. yeah no we're continuing to develop and um, iterate on that as well so the Otsuka model is a develop co-development model where we have um, worked together to um, to create that new digital medicine we. Um, Kind of call it an engaged license model, where yes, they are licensing some of the um, some of the patents and the technology, but it's really been developed together. And um, but Otsuka will own the uh, NDA and the marketing and the promotion. It will be branded um, Otsuka. Okay. Great. Okay, I think with that we will wrap up. I will conclude by saying that our next. Uh, Digital Health Business Forum webinar will be October 4th, and uh, you will receive communication shortly about how to sign up for that. Thank you so much. Appreciate everyone participating.